Thai, Thai, Kutos, Kutos, Makro, B, Mesos, Makro, B, Mesos, Epi, Tekne, Tekne, Taste, Taste, Apongalia, Apongalia. All right. There's some pretty good words in these next few verses that we can look at. And in this matter, that kutos there, of course, you know what kai is, don't you? Everybody can say kai. I bet, I bet no one can say kai. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not even talking yet. He's our scholar in waiting. Yeah, our scholar in waiting. <laughs> kai. That's and. Here it is and. It's a conjunction, okay? Page 208 if you want to look that up. <laughs> kutos, so it's 296 if you want to look that one up. Kuto is a little adverb. In this manner, leave. When it's an adverb, it means it, it entails some action. Okay? There's action in it. Alright? And then, having been long suffering or long spirited, patient. Alright? Having been long suffering, nominative, singular, masculine, first heiress, participle, active. What's first heiress? Tense. Remember what first heiress is? First and second heiress. Punctiliar action. Punctiliar action. First heiress is very punctiliar, and second heiress has just got a little bit of linearity to it. All right? It, it took a while, but it's punctiliar. It is basically something that happened. All right? And a participle, it maps it was a rolling matter. Okay? And in this manner, Having been long suffered, long spirited, patient, okay? Now, he obtained the promise. Who's it talking about? Who's it talking about? If you go back, you'll find out it's talking about Abraham, all right? And uh, how that he believed in God and he was long suffered, he obtained the promise. How did Abraham obtain the promise? That word epi pixet. That literally, uh, if you want to look it up on page uh, 632 and there, and page 162 in the uh, Zonerman's Analytical uh, Greek lexicon, it means to lit a light on. He obtained his life faith. All right, let's, let's go on. It means to hit the mark. Uh, hit the mark. To hit the mark. It means to acquire, to obtain. The word in Latin is. A tigere, et contingere, and then in German it's treffen. It means to reach or to obtain or to master something. Okay? To reach, to obtain, or to master it. To light upon it. How did, and it says, pace upon Galeas. Upon Galeas means what? It comes from, the word angel comes from that. Angel. And look at it. In, in Greek it's Angalia or Angelos, okay? Angalia or Angelos. It's our English word that comes right straight from Greek. And then it says Apongalia. Now what the an angel is a messenger, alright? This means the upon message. The upon message. This means the gospel. Also. The upon message was the gospel. God preached to Abraham the what? The gospel, the message, the message. What is the message? Repent and believe. <laughs> That's, it's still the same message as the Holy Spirit does what today? He convicts you of what? Sin, righteousness, and what? Judgment to come. And he also convicts you that there is mercy to be found. Isn't there? There is mercy to be found from God. God has never wanted us to He has never wanted to kill the sinner. Did you know that? Somebody's got to die. In the Old Testament, I read the rabbinical, I've been studying the, the Hebrew Old Testament, I've been having a ball with that as I've been teaching Exodus and everything. And I've read all the rabbinical arguments and comments, and even from the Greek scholars and the Hebrew scholars and all of it all together, the Latin and the German and the whole shoot match. You've got to read it all. And they said, and as you get older, you begun, 
or you begin to understand that animals are more than just animals. When you're young, you know, life is fleeting. I mean, you see, you see a dead dog on the side of the road, but when you get older, you begin to feel those bumps because you realize you're fragile. You're fragile. All right? And the same word for soul for the animal is the same word for soul in English. And I know a lot of people don't believe this, but if you look it up in Greek, it's nephesh. It's simple as that. Every time, now Sunday morning, when we, I think it's Sunday morning, we're going to show that the seven feasts that know us on Sunday afternoon. On the lost ten tribes, they're doing sacrifices. The rabbi said the life is in the blood. The soul is in the blood. That's what they say of the animal. Say the animal does not have the sin nature that we have. It's innocent. It is innocent life. It is simple, innocent life. It does. Animals do what God programmed them to do. All right? They don't have any... I can't... I don't understand whether they have an eternal soul like we do or what it is, but there's something there. I don't know what. But the rabbis even uh, refer to it. But something innocent dies for something that is guilty. Those animals, when they brought them to the altar, they brought them to the right side of that altar over there, and they took a sharp knife, if it was a, it was a bull or whatever it was, a bull or, or a goat or a sheep, and they put their hands on top of its head and caressed it firmly like you do when you touch your dog or whatever you know they love to have you to have their hands on it except then they pull the head back and they cut its throat and it's like its soul is gone that innocent life has been blood has been shed for the guilty what did it stand for the death of Christ which he was innocent. Life was. Right. Every animal. When I pray, I pray like an Indian. People tell me that. I know Don Laity would come over to my house and I, and I sit there and pray. And he, he said, You always pray like an Indian. <laughs> well, I do. But it means something to me. When I pray and we have food, I say, Lord, thank you for the food we have and let it be for the nourishment of our body and thank you for the life of the animal that gave its life for us. Because the animal did. It did give its life for it. It felt pain that I might eat and have life. Jesus felt pain that we might obtain light upon the promise. Now, when did Abraham get receive? When did he hold out Long suffering. When did he obtain the promise? When did he obtain it? Never in this life did. When he died. You know what keeps you from the real promises of God? The Bible says that when Jesus Christ on the cross, when he laid down his life, he laid down the veil of his flesh. If you go in there in that. <coughs> tabernacle over there. In that tabernacle, the first room in there is called the holy place. The second place is called the holy of holies, but what separates the first holy place from the holy of holies, it is a veil, which has a picture of the ark and the angels on it, basically. That's what's on the other side. What keeps us from the real promises of God today is the veil of our flesh. The veil of Abraham's flesh kept him from the total, full promises of God. Why, his children have never totally received all the promises that God gave and made to them for how many thousands of years? Thousands of years. They have never received that. Land. They're fighting over there right now, at this moment. They're fighting over there. They're fighting. So when did Abraham light on the promise? When did he light on it? Epi, decay. When he 
laid down the veil of his flesh and went into the beatific vision, the very presence of God. That's when he obtained the promise. And that's when we obtain the full promise today. It's when we leave this flesh, we lay down the veil of our flesh. But, never does a child of God, ever is a child of God buried permanently. You don't bury a child of God permanently. You can't hold them down. The coffins, the urns that they put your ashes in, the coffins, the coffins that they put your body in is nothing but a hope chest. But it's sure hope, as we're going to see. Psalm, uh, not Psalm, but Hebrews 11 and 33 and 615 and James 4 and 2, Genesis 12 and verse 4 and 21 and verse 5. Uh, these are all cross-references in Romans 11 and 7. These are cross-references to this verse here. Okay? Now in 6 and verse 16. Let's go over 6 and verse 16. Anthropoi. Anthropoi. What word in English comes from that word? Anthropology. The study of mankind. All right? Gar. Gar. Kata. Kata. Tu. Tu. Mezonos. Mezonos. Omniusen. Kai, Aseis, Altois, Atalogias, Heros, Ace, Babios, Night, Smart, Tongue Tie, The Biosin, Ho, Hokos, Horkos, that is. All right, now let's look at these words. We get our word mankind from there. Man or mankind, okay. Page 30, if you want to write that down and go look it up in that in, uh, Zondervan's Analytical Greek Lexicon. And then Gar, a casual particle or conjunction, page 75 in your Analytical Lexicon. Or if you want to look it up in, in A.T. Robertson's Great Big Grammar, it's on page 1190. Then according to a preposition, page 213 of the greater... All right. Genitive singular definite article of the greater. You can put of the one greater. All right. Comparative there. He swears. Third person plural present addicting active from all no. All right. And of all to them debating, that word debating at the Logias there, that word antilogias, that means to throw words against each other. Uh, just like playing tennis. You know when you go, you put a, what do you call that thing? A net between you. And you go out there and you hit a ball back and forth, a tennis ball back and forth. That's exactly the word picture that this draws of talking and debating. All right. It stops all debating. All right. Uh, debating. Until we go to cast words against each other. Face to face opposition. Then it says it's an end unto the confirmation of the oath. All right. An end. All right. Peros. An extremity. A limit. A boundary. All right. Conclusion. Page 317 if you want to look that one up. Ace. Little, little ace. Look at there. That's a preposition. Page 119. If you want to look that one up. Extension or limitation of thought or verbal action. That's the grammatical rule. And I like for you to remember that one. Extension or limitation of thought or verbal action. It means it can go forward or reverse. It means unto, through, beyond, or even because of. All right? Right here it means unto, beyond. All right? Confirmation. Baby Olsen. Galatians 3.15, Exodus 22 and verse 11. That's what that refers to. And then the oath. The word porcos there, and the word swear up there, they basically come from the same type of idea there. It means to fit yourself in. To fit yourself in. I think that there's a little guy over there that's going to get fenced in right now. 
<laughs> it means to fence yourself in. Where you can't go any, it, throw a boundary up. It says, I talk about the confirmation of an oath. Now, when people swear, they swear by what? Someone greater. But God, can God swear by anyone greater than himself? Is there any other limit? Is there any more limit? With God? God is it. All right. And then verse 17 now, six and, chapter 6 and verse 17. In? Boy, it looks just like English, doesn't it? O Parisoteron Ulaminos O Theos Hey, say that, Marilyn. Epidexe Toy Play Rono Play Rono Boys Taste Upon Galeos to, ametei teito, teis, bulais, auto, emesi tusen, porco, all right. There's some beautiful, beautiful words in this verse. Cross references to the last verse, which I forgot to give you, were Matthew 12, 42, Luke 11, 31, Galatians 3, 15, Exodus 22, verse 11, Romans 11, 18, and Philippians 1 and 7. All right, now let's go on. In which, all right, locative singular, relative pronoun, that's going to hold there, okay? More abundantly, more convincingly, beyond doubt, okay? Pariso Tero. If you want to look that one up, it comes from Parisos. It's a little comparative adjective, and you can look it up on table 7F and under A in the front of your Zonimer's lexicon. It'll show you a little bit about it. And on page 321. I've been looking these things up for you, as you can see. A lot of them I have memorized. <laughs> All right, willing, willing. Look at that word willing there. Wishing. Spiritual activity. Spiritual activating force, that voluminous. Nominee, singular, masculine, present, participle, and its middle voice. Look at that middle voice. At which more abundantly wishing the God for himself. Nothing calls God want to save man or want to create man except for whom? Why did God create man in his own image? The only thing he created in his image. Why did he do it? What does the book of Revelation tell you? Yeah, because he wanted to. For his own way, he did to. That's why he did it. And right here it says he was willingly did this middle voice. Who did it? Nominee singular masculine. Definite article, nominee singular masculine. Now, the God. Epidexe. All right, epidexe. That means to point out. To point out. Now, this little rascal I've got to change real fast. I hope. That one's not even going to be well. Oh, I've got to rewind a bunch of these. I gotta find one that's been rewound. I've been getting behind on my work here. I looked at that and I thought it was already rewound, but evidently it wasn't. Come on, open up. Working. 
take a parenthetical moment <laughs> to get that thing straightened out. I looked at that thing and I thought it was rewound, but evidently it wasn't. All right, to point out, epidexe, it means to point out plainly, plainly, to point out, to indicate. We get a word to index from this word. Dexis, index, to point out. And the word epi upon the front of it means what? When you put epi upon the front of something, what happens? That intensifies it. It means to plainly, thoroughly point out to the ones, choice there, dating plural, masculine, all right, definite article. And, and there, in between that definite article, there is a practical substantive. Am I using words too big for you? Practical substance it means it's a, a, a noun or an adjective in there He's describing to the ones, to the ones, all right, to the ones, heirs. Look at the word heirs, play role no me up, play, play role no voice. They do plural masculine, all right. It literally means lot, law. Lot is kleros, and then law is nomos. Your word name comes from this word. Word name, name comes from the Greek word nomos. What does your name mean? What does name mean? What they call you. What they call you. All right. When you get ready to go do something and sign a contract or something, what do you put down on that contract? What they call you. Your John Henry or John Hancock, whatever you want. It's your name, your nomos. Your name, according to law, you have a name. Randall, you have a name. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What, what is your full name? Three of them, actually. Actually, you got three. What, what is your whole name? Mark Randall. Mark Van Cook. Van Cook. Mark Randall Van Den Cook. Okay, Bill, what's your name? I ain't telling nobody. <laughs> <laughs> they already know who you are. It's Billy. No, that's my first name. Billy what? It's not Bloomer, is it? No, no, no. <laughs> it's, and I hate this. Uh, Harold. Harold. All right. Billy what's really Harold. Mama, what's my, my daddy's name's Harold. That's well, my name. mama used to say, Billy Harold, you better get your butt in here. I'll tear you up like a sow. Uh, 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 that was embarrassing. Well, that is your legal name, isn't it? Yeah. That's your name to you legally. Anytime your mom legally. uses your first and middle name together, you're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The switch trouble. gets bigger. Yeah. That's your name according to the law. I scribble my name now. I have to scribble my name on a piece of paper, a couple of pieces of paper today. He said, I can't read that. And I said, yeah, but that's legal. <laughs> that's my name. That's my legal signature. All right. According to law, that is my name, and when I sign my name, I am legally liable for that name. Okay? That's just the way it is, people. Now let's go back and look at this lot law. An heir established by law. Heirs that are firmly established by law. He point out, he wanted to point out plainly. First Harris Infinity Active point out plainly to the ones his heirs according to established law. Okay? According to established law. Is this word used in Ephesians? Like, yes. Yes. I, I, yes. I, I, A lot of times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of the apocalypse, of the promise, of the secured promise. Effie on the front of that promise means secured promise. Absolute, established, considered as a fact. Because secured promise, the Bahaita Sinko. All right? In, uh, what? Do you have your Amplified Bible there, Brother Randall? Yeah, quick question yeah. about this in grammar. The prefix epi means to intensify, but here we have apongolius. Is it? Is it that way? Promises is a Paul Galeas. Paul is an established promise. Is a, a confirmed promise. But the F is the same as the epi. 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 Is it just has the I dropped so that it reads smoother? Is that why? Yeah. 
It's just fun for you for the for you to, yeah, it comes from Effie on the front of it. You just draw the the yell to haunt it, all right? Because here we, we would have two uh vowels together with it. Right. Yield and alpha. So you drop the the yield off of that one. Okay. And the unchangeableness. Now Brother Randall, can you read number seventeen for us? Accordingly, God also, in his desire to show more convincingly and beyond doubt to those who were to inherit the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose and plan, intervened, mediated with an oath. All right. He made the oath himself, didn't he? Who swore to Abraham that Abraham would get the promise? This is what we call uh, an unconditional covenant. An unconditional covenant. Salvation is an unconditional covenant. And I'm going to go on and throw you a great big curve here, but brideship is, is conditional. Brideship is conditional. And that relates to you and your purpose. Salvation is unconditional. You find that in the book, in the book of Revelation. The bride has made herself ready, little boy. Now I talk about salvation. The bride is in close proximity. Look at that tabernacle there. We're studying that, and of course we're studying that here. Around the edge of that tabernacle, who was in close proximity to the presence of God? Who was it? What? Well, there were four tribes. I mean, there were tribes. tribes in four different directions. But what tribe was next to the glory of God always? Mm -hmm. Levi. Uh, Levi. Levi. The tribe of Levi. With closeness, proximity, comes responsibility. They were more accountable than anybody else. By the way, no Levi even had one single solitary inheritance. Did you know that? They didn't, know, they didn't inherit anything. They had it all. They had the presence of God. They were always there. The, all the other tribes supported them. With privilege comes accountability. And closeness. All inside of there. You know that Jesus could never go into the holy place or the holy of holies in the temple. Never could he. He couldn't do that. Only the high priest did. Now did Jesus really go into the holy of holies? We're going to find out he did. But it was a holy of holies in heaven. Right. On the other side of the real place. All right. He did. But that closeness there, that relationship, that Holy of Holies in there typifies the very presence of God. Today, the holy place is God's church. That's his church. Where you really get business, I mean, you can pray outside of church. But if you really want to get business, if you want to get serious with God, you go to church, to a local visible assembly, and you pray. You can pray all the way around. They had prayers all the way around there. But where was, where did the high priest go in and put all the prayers up to God? Where did he go? He went in there to the altar of incense. And that, God's churches are twice-blooded people. I told you that before. This I don't mean to throw you a curve. It's a twice-blooded people. They're bloody twice. Okay? All salvation. Here is salvation right here. That's the that's the that's the altar in it. Okay? There are a lot of people that are saved from the world that never know what a New Testament church is, period. They don't know. On the other side of that altar is what? What's that other thing? Before you get to the tabernacle. That's the the labor. That stands for baptism today. Real baptism. Baptism. And then inside of there on the right hand side is what? 
On the right hand side when you walk into the holy place. The table of showbread. That's the Lord's Supper today. Always. It was, and there was 12 loaves on there that God wanted his, his tribes always in his remembrance. That's the table of showbread. Right to the left side was what? The left side. The candlestick. How did they see the, the minister in there in the holy place? By the light of the candlestick. Why do God's churches are the only ones that really know all the truth? Because they got the light of the Holy Spirit that came upon the day of Pentecost and is still there, leading them in all truth, not some of it. Why there are people out in the world, a lot of people in a lot of churches got enough information to be saved. Why do half the people in the world don't even know whether they're saved eternally, Brother Bill? Why do half of the people in the world that are saved don't even know whether they're saved forever? Because they don't hear the word, the That's proper not. word. They don't hear the word. That is a type of the church day, and right in front of that is the altar of incense. Could you take what happened when uh, Nadab and Abihu took strange fire in on the altar of incense? God exactly. What God did to them? Killed them. Killed them. Why? Why did he kill them? They could come right out here on this altar here. They had to take coals of fire from this altar into that altar. <coughs> Why? Why could they only take that? Because that fire was purified. Fire does two things. It either judges or purifies. They took coals of fire that did not come from that altar. That altar there, that fire, those coals were tainted, purified by blood. The blood of the sacrifice. Your prayer's not going to do you much good unless you're saved. <laughs> Period. Are they? But then they take them in there and they put it on the altar of incense that stood before the veil. You see how beautiful that is? And right in the middle of all that stuff, you see the cross. The cross. The cross of Jesus Christ. Through all of that stuff. Let's go on now. We're going to point out to the ones legal heirs according to law. That word clero and nomo, so okay. The confirmed, secured promise, considered as a fact, the unchangeableness, unchangeableness. This is what we call the alpha primitive here. It comes from alpha meta intensity. All right? All right? Unchangeableness. On with. Is it. it means a foundation that cannot be removed. Literally. It means that God pledged himself. In Ephesians, the first chapter, it tells us that when we're saved, this is the unconditional covenant. It has nothing to do with us. Okay? The unconditional covenant. It says that God gives you what as a down payment? What does God always, from all the way from Adam on, what did God give everybody as a down payment? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your person. God takes you, you're a triune by nature. Here you are. I draw this thing so many times you see this in your sleep probably. You have you have body, material, you have Spirit, and you have soul. That word suke and nefesh. Okay? We have this in us. This spirit right here, when we're born into this world, the spirit we have in us is the spirit of rebellion. But when we're born again, God zaps that spirit and gets rid of it and puts his spirit in you, and forever that is your brand. You are branded. You are branded for redemption. You can never get unbranded. Isn't that beautiful? Y'all say amen to that. Amen. That, that's unchangeable. 
God's not going to change his mind. Now, what does God say? He says he gives us as an earnest down payment. Earnest money. When you go down and you buy a piece of property and you put a down payment down. Okay? What happens if you don't come up with the rest of the money? They foreclose on huh? it. They keep your money. Now let's look at it this way. Now this is what God is talking about. This is a beautiful, beautiful promise. <laughs> the unchangeableness of the established by law will. This is his last will and testament now. Okay? By will. The unchangeableness. Now, if God puts the Holy Spirit in you and doesn't redeem you, what does he lose? His existence. The existence of God. God will cease to exist if he can lose you. There's a lot of people running around the world who've never been saved, been baptized, whatever. They don't know the Lord. All right? When you really are convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come, and you really repent of your sin, the Holy Spirit comes in your body, and you are not your own anymore. You're not your own. Okay? Hebrews, the 12th chapter, says... There's an old Baptist doctrine called once saved, always saved. We've been teaching that for 2,000 years. But I want you to understand one other thing. There are a lot of people that think they're saved that are not saved. If you don't repent, you don't get saved. You can be baptized. You can go in wet and come out wet. I mean, go in dry and come out wet, and you're going to be just as lost as you went in if you don't. Sal salvation does not come in baptism. What comes in baptism? Look over there to that tabernacle. It tells us something. What comes in baptism? Where do you get saved? You get saved at the altar, don't you? What comes after baptism? What does baptism get you into? Into the church. Covenant relationship with God. You're saved before. Only Baptists teach things, by the way. <laughs> You're not going to hear this anyplace else. That baptism. Then you get into that covenant relationship with God. You can never, you can get kicked out of the church. You can't. You can walk off and leave all of your rewards. But you'll never get out of the family of God. Never. Because God says that my very existence I put on the line for you to be redeemed. But there's many people out in the world that think they have signed a contract with God because they've just been baptized. Baptism doesn't say. If God's Spirit is convicting you when you do wrong, if you can go out and just do your own thing, if you can go out and just do whatever you want to, with no repercussions, the greatest evidence is, is that you're not saved, that you don't know the Lord. You can't do that. If you go out and sin, what's God going to do to you? What's the Hebrews 12 chapter say? He's going to beat the tar out of you. He you he'll, he'll spank you up straight. He will. Now, God don't spank the devil's children. I want you to understand. He don't spank the devil's children. But once you're his child, you're his child forever. You don't get unchilded. You can't get unborn. All right. The will of him... And then Epi, Emi, C. Tucson. This is a, a compound word, and it means to pledge oneself as a surety. Now, it says that also in the book of Ephesians. All right, he made an oath, the unchangeable of his will, and he made strong, he intervened as mediator. This word is only used one time in the New Testament. Third person singular, first Harris and Dignity Vacuum. Messi Tio is where it comes from. It is a mediated sponsor. Go back. Buy an oath. Right? Now when uh, we got an we got an example of this in the Old Testament. When Moses went up on the mountain with God first time. When Moses went up on the mountain with God the first time he did. 
What was the law written on? Stone. Huh? Stone. Probably stone. The word can mean wood. It can mean wood, but it's probably stone. All right. Who prepared all of the material and wrote on that first law? On the front and the back of this piece. God wrote it and God prepared all the material. He did. All right. And Israel, all the while that he was doing this, God was writing it and carving it out. What was going on down the mountain? They were sinning in rebellion. They were sinning in rebellion. Aaron, the goldsmith, Aaron, the goldsmith, carved out a wooden calf and then beat plates of gold all around it and said, This is Jehovah. That brought you out of Egypt. The calf was Jehovah. Talk about blasphemy. Now, when you're real close to God and you're real responsible to God, when you're close up there and you blow it, what happens? You're in a lot of trouble. And when Moses went up on that mountain, he told the whole people of Israel, he said, Aaron and her are your representatives now. you got any problems, you go to Aaron or her. So when Moses went up on the mountain with God and Aaron and her were down there, who was responsible for all the actions? Aaron and her. And then Aaron lied to Moses when he came down. What did Moses do to the tablets of stone that God had prepared? He threw them down and broke them to pieces because Israel had already broken the covenant. All he did was physically show them what they had done. Moses didn't do anything wrong. Moses wasn't mad and broke the covenant of God. Israel broke the covenant of God and he showed them what happened. In Native American culture, all right, Native American culture, there is a what they call a ceremonial pipe or the peace pipe. When the white man came to this country, when the white man came to America and they made contracts or what they called treaties with the Indians, the Indian says, let's poke the pipe. You know why they did that? It's an unbreakable contract for the Indians. It's an unbreakable contract because they had asked God to come in here and witness it. And when you witness anything to God, then it couldn't be broken. Your eternal destiny rode on being truthful from now on because God will thump you. All right? So they did that. They smoked the pot. Well, for instance, if you are a an Indian girl and boy, and you get married. What you do is you take the pipe out and you offer it to the four directions and to heaven and earth, and you smoke that pipe together. You breathe out the words of the covenant that you're going to make. You inhale it and smoke and breathe it out, and, and it's seen. And God witnesses what you said. Now, if one of them becomes unfaithful to the other, if one becomes unfaithful to the other, you know what they have to do? For instance, if I got married to an Indian girl, we smoked the pipe together, and that girl ran off and left me. You had to break the pipe and bury it. Break the pipe and bury it. I think they got that way back yonder. Somehow or another, and it came over. When Moses came down off that mountain because of what Israel had already done, he broke the covenant. Because they'd already broken it. The covenant was broke. Now, when Moses went back up on the mountain, what had to happen? What did God tell him to do? He had to make a new covenant. A new covenant. Moses, you are now. When God was up on the mountain, what was God going to do to the whole nation of Israel? What did God tell Moses? I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to kill them all. Just stand back, Moses. I'm going to kill every one of them. And I will make you a mighty nation. From you. And what Moses did. He interceded. And he said, no, don't do it, Lord. Don't do it. And he went down and he got real mad, all right. He threw the, co he threw the covenant down. He broke it right in front of their face because they'd already broken it. And then God said, because Moses was the intercessor... He was the intercessor. He was the go-between. He was a mediator. He was the sponsor. Okay? 
That's what this works. Is. This works to mediate as a sponsor. So when Moses went back up and received the covenant of God again, what did he do? He had to prepare the material for God to write on. He had to get the plates. The plates, plural. He had to carve out the plates. And he took them, and then God wrote on the plates. He was a mediator. Before, God prepared the material and the words. Now, Moses prepares the plates, okay? And God writes the words because he is a mediator. Who is reinstituted the covenant with Israel? Who reinstituted it? Moses. When we walk away from God, when we come to the age of accountability, when we walk away from God, When we walk away from God, who institutes the new covenant? Who sponsored it? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is our sponsor. All right. That's what the word means. He sponsors it with an oath. How firmly are you saying? As firm as the existence of God is. If you could ever be lost after you've been saved, there'd be no God. Amen? That's beautiful. That's beautiful. All right. That's beautiful. We are saved forever. 618. 618. Hebrews 618. Hina. Hina. Dia. Duo. Pragmato. Our word pragmatic comes right out of that word now. Meta Phaeton. And Brandy, get ready with your other book again. We need that. Amplified Bible again. Ametetheto tone in voice adina tone adina tone susaste susaste. You can put tone in there. It actually isn't in the original, but it's an understood definite article. Tone theon tone theon east caron east caron para clason para clason ecolman ecolman hoi hoi kata figontes Kratese, Pace, Pro Kai Manes, El Pedos. All right, there it is. In order that, by the agency of two things, in the Old Testament, what does it say about if you if, if uh, someone is going to be uh, executed for murder? What happens? What, what's necessary? If you're going to execute somebody for murder in the Old Testament, what happens? By two or three witnesses, let everything be established. And here we have the same thing. When God does something, he has to have two witnesses too. Okay? This is what, what God's two witnesses are. By the two things. All right? Brother Randall, are you, have you got an open there? Uh-huh. This was so that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, in which it is impossible for God ever to prove false or deceive us, we who have fled to him for refuge might have mighty indwelling strength and strong encouragement to grasp and hold fast the hope appointed for us and set before us. All right. In order that, by two things, it's unchangeable. In the which is unable to lie the God. It's unable. God is not able to lie. That's number one. All right. And uh, we have a strong consolation. That word practice pragmatone there, that means two pragmatic, it means two substantive, ca concrete, tangible things, witnesses, all right? Our English, pragmatic, all right? And it's unable for God to lie. And we have a strong, the unchangeable of his character and his inability to lie. 
God's not going to change. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and what? Tomorrow. He's the same. He's the eternal Jehovah. That's who he is. All right? And then it's impossible for God to lie. One thing, it's, it's impossible for God to change. And another thing, it's impossible for God to lie. So we have two irrefutable witnesses. Thank you. All right? The strong consolation, paraclesi. When, you, when we talk about the comforter, he's a paraclete. That's a term that's used. That comes right out of Greek. The consolation, the comforter. We have, first person singular, present subjunctive, active. We may have. Who does your salvation depend on to get saved? Jesus is. Well, you've got to be willing. Huh? God going to save me beyond your will? Against your will? I can't do that. That would be changing the nature of God. Wouldn't it? All right, you may be saved, and you may have the consolation. And then it says, the ones having fled. Nominee, plural, masculine, second heir, part, simple, active, having fled. The word, the city of refuge, this is what the term used in the Septuagint is. This is the city of refuge. When you're guilty of murder in the Old Testament, and it wasn't intentional, you could run to a city of refuge, and you could stay alive as long as you were there. Nobody could touch you. And you were looked upon as a guest of honor there. That's the way God wanted it. Right? Having fled to a city of refuge. What is that city of refuge? Lay up a hold of, to lay hold of. They say this word mightily, to lay hold of. First Paris, infinitive active. Proteo. Might. Of the thing, having been set right down in front of us. Genitive, singular, feminine, present, participle, middle voice, by himself, God did it for you. El Pideos, all right? The whole. Numbers 23, 19, Titus 1 and 2, Hebrews 3, 6, and Hebrews 7, 19, Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. Go to Hebrews 1, 11 through 14 now, Brother Randall. Ephesians. Ephesians. Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. Oh. <laughs> right, right. My left. Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. It's, yeah. Real loud. All the way over this way. Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. Yeah. In him we also were made God's heritage portion, and we obtained an inheritance, for we have been foreordained, chosen and appointed beforehand, in accordance with his purpose, who works out everything in agreement with the counsel and design of his own will, so that we who first hope in Christ, who put our confidence in him, have been destined and appointed to live for the promise of his glory. In him you also who have heard the word of truth, the glad tidings, the gospel of our salvation, and have believed in and adhered to and relied on him, were stamped with the seal of the long promised Holy Spirit. All right, there's your there's your brand. You were branded permanently, indelibly, with the Holy Spirit of promise, all right? Verse fourteen. That spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance, the first fruits, the prayers and foretaste, the down payment of our heritage, in anticipation of its full redemption and our acquiring complete possession of it to the praise of his glory. Well, I don't know how you could put it in Strauss sound from that, could you? These two scriptures in the New Testament tell us we're eternally saved if we repent and trust in Him. If we repent and trust in Him. Well, we will start on 6 and verse 19 next time. Well, I tell you what, whole nine, it doesn't even sound right, does it? Well, Jesus himself couldn't have went 
because he was not a high priest in his earthly form, he couldn't have went in. He couldn't have gone into the tabernacle, or he couldn't have gone into the temple. But he was already there. Yeah. Because he was the Shekinah glory that was there. If in the temple, if the temple ever had, and only Solomon's temple had the Shekinah glory of God, it was only Jesus was the Shekinah glory of Jehovah. He is the presence of God. He is the physical, material expression of the Godhead. And, 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 and the only God you'll ever see. Another question I got, Ken, yes. is, is the, the Holy Spirit in the Old Bible came and went. He was not indwelled in us. No. It just no. came and went. No, okay. That's what Protestants usually say. All right? Yeah. But that's not true. The Holy Spirit, in acting and inspiring people and doing great acts, Yes, he did come and go. But those people, how many times how many kinds of salvation are there in the Bible? How many kinds of salvation are there? How is the only way that you're ever going to get saved? And the Holy Spirit came and dwelled in them in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. What happened on the day of Pentecost is the Shekinah glory came on the church to lead her into all truth. What happened on the day of Pentecost was not the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but the empowering of the Holy Spirit on the church. Oh, okay, so they were already that. indwelt, and the Spirit of God came and sealed them from Adam all the way on. And, You're sealed. And so the Holy Spirit was empowered at that point. That happens at salvation. That happens at salvation. Yes. Yeah. But what happened on the day of Pentecost was the Holy Spirit of God came down and immersed his church in his power. And he said, I'll be with you. Where are there? And here's another thing. People say, well, where there are two or three gathered in the Lord's name, they're there. But that's not what it's talking about. Two or three gathered together in my name as a church. A legal church. All right? Where two or three are together as a church, I'll be in the midst of them. And that's, and that's why God's church have always preached the truth. All the way down to the ages. Now, all them other ones, there's all kinds of shades of truth. All right. What I'm teaching you here is only Baptist. <laughs> so, so the Holy Spirit you're going to hear. was always with us, but it was empowered after Jesus. The, with the, church the Spirit the came church. upon, externally upon the church. And I keep, I keep saying this: over the church is the people. The church is the people. But the family of God are all those that are saved. There's a lot of people saved outside of God's defense of church that yeah. never... Now, the Holy Spirit tries to lead them there, but some of them don't go. Yeah. Many of them won't go. But that Spirit leading them into all truth is upon the church. And it will be with the church until the end of this age. And there's a whole lot of difference there. What I'm telling you, the Protestant world does not know. I'm telling you. It does not know. As great as J. Vernon McGee was, he was a great teacher. He never, I've never heard him ever teach this one time. Never once. Because he interpreted this as the family of God to him was the church. The family of God to most people is the church. The family of God are those that are faithful, real believers. The family of God are the real believers. The church are those that are covenanted together that tabernacle stands for that church. There's a lot of people on the other side of that first veil, isn't there? That are saved. Yes. But that real baptism, scriptural baptism, that's why they call us Anabaptists. What is there, is there a anybody else? verse in, in uh, Revelation that refers to uh, the saved and the holy? Word saints. When you, were, when you talk about saints or saved people, it means not of earth. You're born the first time of earth, of earthly parents. You're born again. You're born from above. All right? In the book of Hebrews, we're going to find out where it talks about the, the general assembly in the end times of the whole family of everything in heaven and earth. All right? That's where the bride comes together there in the end. Uh, the, there aren't going to be many brides. There's going to be one bride. And I don't understand how all that works. But that bride is going to be sitting on the throne with her husband. Ruling. 
But there's going to be a lot of guests at the wedding, aren't there? Yeah. There's a lot of guests at the wedding. They're not all of them are the bride. We know that for sure. All right. And I've said this many times. If you won't serve the Lord here, and if you're saved, you're going to be a ditch digger in heaven. You're going to be a servant. <laughs> you're going to learn how to serve for eternity. You won't do it right now. The Lord's going to teach you how. All right. Well, I'd run you over a little bit tonight. Why don't you get short cuts? Oh, I hope not to short cuts. Yeah. I'm not short. The bill's always <laughs> worried. I'm going to teach you everything. <laughs> There's a lot. <coughs> well, go out and do something eternal this week. Go out and do something worthwhile. Go out and do something eternally that you will take with you to heaven. All right. Brother David, would you dismiss this prayer for my brother? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege that we have to come and to learn your word, Father. <clears throat> we just thank you for Brother Jim and his study that he uh, puts into to uh, bring us this message, Father. We just uh, ask that you impart it on our hearts that we'll go out and share it with others, Lord. We pray for our children who don't know you, Father, that, uh, that they'll repent, they'll turn to you, Father, and call, call your name out. Lord, we just uh, we pray for Brother Billy and his family and that you'll give them comfort, Father, and we just, we just thank you for all your blessings and things that you've done for us, Father. We, we know we don't deserve it, but we thank you for it. Your precious name.